There we go. All right, thank you. Good evening. Um, several of us have spoken about what a spring-like evening this is. Yay, at long last. Because <laughs> I know I was out there shoveling last Monday. And, uh, uh, that's a little too much. But anyway, here we are. Um, welcome to you all. Um, I do want to make an announcement that I don't think I made last week. And it, we, nothing went wrong. But there may be a pop-out of the internet. And if that happens, just hold tight in 20 seconds or 30 seconds, it all gets worked out. So if that happens both online or here, um, don't worry. It's under control, so to speak. So um, our topic tonight is what's in an ideology? What are the consequences of an ideology? Rethinking masculinity. We'll get to how we got to that topic in a minute. Tonight, I just want to say this is the fifth topic in the series of six on truth and politics. This topic is on truth and politics. It forms the year-long uh, shifting landscapes in which we started with the rubble before us during the pandemic. We were all overwhelmed by all the things that were coming forward and we needed to fix and fix and fix and how are we going to do it? And rather than be overwhelmed, we decided to select six topics, there were six of us, each one got to pick a topic, and we would simply give it three nights, not enough to by any means come anywhere near the, uh, the contours of a topic, but that was still, that was important of itself, um, just to dip down and take a look at some things and put some ideas together and keep going forward. So, our supporters. Michigan Humanities, and the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs. As I say every night when I thank those two organizations, I thank all of you and all of us here tonight um, for our tax dollars. They are well at work. It's produced by a team, Kathy Organ. Kathy is not here. She is uh, uh, out in California taking care of a sister who had some surgery. Um, so we but think of her and Thomas Trahey in the back. Um, I'm Brooke Portman, Kathy Calabretta is on Zoom, and then um, the two people who were part of our group from the beginning, um, Mike McKinney, who is a retired now faculty member from West Shore, and Matt Sanderson, a professor of philosophy at West Shore. Eric Smith um, was the director of the library. He has contributed cash from the library for this project. Um, kindly allowed Thomas to be so fully a part of the team um, and contributing um, immeasurably. Nathan is also here, a part of the team, helping us out. Yes, I was going to look for him over there. Last time I saw him, he was there. There he is in the back. Thanks, Nate. And Sue Carlson over here, who does all of our um, press releases and all of that kind of marketing. And Lisa Danes is um, not at the office today, but she also does all the website work. So those are the people. The mind needs the body in order to think. So that's why every night here live anyway, we have coffee and sweets. And um, I will keep telling my brother, he does a great job from all of you, but his head is about out to here already. So <laughs> I will still do it. I'm a good sister and I'm a big sister, right? <laughs> Nine years older than he is. I keep reminding him. I'm been there first. Um, so I hope those at home are giving yourselves a treat, some kind of beverage um, as well. Preview of next week, as I do each week, it's going to be about communicating over the fence or across the aisle. Um, we talked last week about the First Amendment, and the First Amendment is speaking of our own piece, but it is also, as I learned by studying the First Amendment last week, um, it's also about listening to others. And so next week, Brian Harrison will help us perhaps do that better. So tonight, what's in an ideology? What are the consequences? Rethinking masculinity. We got here by kind of in a way, a roundabout way. It's what happens with research. The first book was Deaths of Despair by two economists and Kate Cates and Anangus Deacon. And they had been looking across the country at um, suicides and deaths by alcoholism and drugs. 
and they saw this kind of repeating pattern. And that pattern was men of 45 to 55 were the ones who were committing suicide, those, and those had those kinds of deaths in much higher numbers than others. And they saw some traits. Um, it has increased um, with women than from, from when they started to now, but it is still um, higher among men. Men 40, still 45 to 55 are the strongest, but there are now, it goes down to 25 year olds to 55 year olds. Those who have not had college education, those who are either um, low, find low employment or unemployed and white. So we kept looking for why. Now the um, Case, Case and Deaton are economists and they have more of an economic uh, focus, but it still didn't look at really, it, it was more systemic um, what's happening in the culture. So they, they saw pharmaceuticals as having a strong responsibility in all of those deaths. Um, but that doesn't tell us still why men were, were dying more, right, more frequently. We also looked at a book by a sociologist slash psychiatrist named John Metzel. His book is called Dying of Whiteness. And he looked at, um, in the Midwest, the Cates and Deaton um, looked primarily in the Midwest too, although the United States was part of their turf. Um, Metzel was very much the heartland of the Midwest. And he found that men there too, um, his, his problem was, why are these men unhappy? Um, and why are they not voting in ways that would support who they are? And his kind of conclusion was more about the racism that they had experienced or that they had, um, if you will, in their hearts. Um, they were more white supremacists. And what was the reason for that? That was an underlying kind of question. Then a physician named um, David Ansel, who is a physician in Chicago and went along the Ogden Avenue corridor and where people were less wealthy, had no wealth, their health was in much poorer shape. And so what could be done about that? And it's also just tracked more men than women. Then we found a 10 page research paper from a research group, four person team in Scotland. And they looked at all of this um, material from the United States and they found in Europe, it also appeared more men were dying of these deaths of despair, which they also termed their deaths um, than others. And it was the same kind of demographic group just in Scotland. This group said, some of the other usual things that people said to them to check out, migration, diet, those kinds of things, were not, were, were not um, statistically sound. They didn't explain these deaths. And what they began to look at was what jobs were available. And the jobs that were available were primarily service jobs, service sector jobs, as they are here. 75 to 78% of the jobs in democratic countries are service jobs. And what the Scotland scientists concluded was, it's only one of, a, of multiple factors, but that these men excluded themselves and were excluded by the places, the service centers, the, the employers, they excluded men from those jobs. So the jobs that are most available right now um, have been in the late 20th and now early 21st century, men don't apply for and won't usually be accepted if they do apply. So there's this whole cycle and they said there's something about the definition of masculinity that isn't working. That's our lead in and how we got around. So it really, it still won't explain completely Case and Deaton nor will it explain Jonathan Metzl's work, nor will it explain David Ansel's work, but it is a component of what we think might be going on and it's certainly worth looking at. And that's why we chose to look at it, to look at it being masculinity and how are men um, programmed and how is our culture programmed to have men in a certain way and in ways that aren't helpful for them, aren't helping them be successful. 
So tonight we have Jessica Hauser, um, who will join me on stage in a minute. She is from West Shore. She is a psychologist at West Shore. And she teaches um, all level, many levels of psychology. They include uh, your, your um, abnormal psych, which of course every student loves. <laughs> loves to diagnose their family, right? <laughs> and their last partner or boyfriend or girlfriend or whomever. Um, and probably that baby brother too. I'd probably do that one. The social psychology. And she also teaches both educational and developmental psychology. I like to say I was on the hiring team who hired Jessica, one of several. I have sat in on multiple classes as Dean out at West Shore. Um, and I got to, um, had to go to new faculties classes for the first three years, both semesters. That was always a joy. And, um, and I was glad before I left as Dean to be able to write a letter of strong recommendation that Jessica received tenure as she did. The thing about Jessica is she's a very creative teacher and she goes out of her way to help her students. She's one of the few ever there who have conducted live experiments with students. And part of that is, is because you have to do extra work. With live human subjects, you have to get cleared for it. You have to write up a proposal, always a proposal, and you have to clear it with faculty and you have to get everybody's support. But she did that. She could have done just simply a lecture, but she wanted an experience that students would remember. And what the experiment was is if somebody falls in public, who helps, who walks away, who freezes? Very interesting experiment because the other dynamic that was in there was it was a faculty member who fell. And in fact, you saw him before. It was Mike Nagel who played the faculty member that fell. <laughs> no help. <laughs> so as you will see tonight, Jessica is thorough and clear. She's able to explore multiple facets, multiple points of view, to bring out both the positive points of view and those who are critiquing problems in the, the material put forward. She is generous and kind. She has a wonderfully wry sense of humor. She, has, she is calm and sure-footed. She's an open-hearted as a person and as a teacher. And like me and like several in this room and online, I hope, she hails from Ohio. So we love MSU and U of M. We live here, we love them until they play Ohio State. And then it's go Bucks. Please help me welcome Jessica Hauser. Thank you, Brooke. Now I have to live up to that. <laughs> second here. Now, a note, um, I'm being conditioned to like Michigan State as opposed to U of M. So just a... <laughs> I hope that doesn't change how you feel about me. <laughs> All right, uh, so for tonight, um, what is an ideology and what are the consequences? Rethinking masculinity. Um, Brooke's already given us the title. Um, so if you go to the next slide. Yes. Um, I did not Photoshop this. Um, I don't know who did. I don't if it might even be a uh, but I thought this would be a, a pertinent photo here on the left. We'll come back to that one. Um, but I did a collage to introduce you to the topic for tonight and what I'm going to be talking about. So down here on the right, I have a picture of Robin Williams. And as many of you know, Robin Williams committed suicide several years ago. And if you don't know, Robin Williams, he had a number of demons. Uh, he had a substance abuse issue with cocaine. He was an alcoholic and he also suffered from depression. Um, there towards the end, he was also recently diagnosed with dementia. And so there was discussion, if you look online about that being a contributing factor to his suicide. 
Above that, a picture of Robin Williams, we have a graph. Um, and what that graph is, uh, if you look, you can, the dates are really hard to see, um, but the last date on there is 2020. And then every year in front of that, so 2019, 2018. And what we're seeing is on that chart, an increase in uh, liquor sales, particularly in the United States. And you can look this up and you find that uh, in, during the first year of the pandemic, alcohol sales increased by 20%. And so we're seeing an increase in the amount of alcohol people are consuming. And then here on the left, uh, we have Putin. <laughs> yes, um, this is uh, one of the favorite, favorite images that I found of him. Um, there's a number of other ones where he's shirtless. He likes to be shirtless for some reason, riding a horse, swimming with dolphins. Uh, and these pictures that we find of him online, they're often you know, very idolized kind of masculine pictures that we see here. And the reason I chose to portray him, one, I think it's apt just because of the um, climate that we have right now with regards to the war in Ukraine. But then the other reason is Putin is often idolized by some people as being this perfect figure of masculinity. But then at the same time, he's also reviled, reviled for the same exact reason. These things are interconnected. Robin Williams, the rise in alcohol, use and the way that we view masculinity. And we're gonna be exploring some of those things because among certain populations of men in the US, we're seeing a rise in suicides and substance abuse related deaths. The American Psychological Association, which I'll be referring to as the APA for short, they have linked these issues among others to traditional masculinity. In other words, there's something about masculine ideology that may be psychologically healthy. It's a ballsy thing to say, that there's something with men that's leading to problems like suicide and substance abuse. Before we get into that, because we're gonna look at both sides of this debate, because there is a debate about this, um, we're gonna step back and we're gonna look at some things like gender norms, gender socialization, and masculine ideologies so that we understand some terminology. Next slide. So first off, um, we're gonna talk about the difference between sex and gender. And I'm sure many of you here know the difference, but I just wanna clarify that. When we talk about sex, that refers to the biological status of being male or female. When we talk about gender, this is the psychological and sociocultural characteristics associated with being girl or boy, man or woman. And this is actually the American Psychological Association, APA's definition of gender. Next slide. In all cultures, gender is, a, gender is a fundamental organizing principle of social life. The many animals have differences in patterns of behavior between men and women, but humans have culture that tells us what we're supposed to do. For example, I have it here. You know, how are we supposed to dress? Um, tonight, I am wearing a dress, which for me is not something that happens all that often as my friends could report to you. Um, the other option could be for me to be wearing a tie as you know, many men would do in this particular social situation. That is, we have certain social norms and expectations for various behaviors and roles that we take on. Next slide. Some of those um, social expectations fall underneath the category of gender roles. Um, so in certain situations, you know, or not in social situations, sorry. Um, so for example, in the case of men, um, men might be identified as being a protector or the provider, whereas the woman, um, her role might be to raise the children and clean the house. Next slide. Then we have gender scripts. Most people recognize gender roles, but um, gender scripts might be a less recognized thing. This is what I started to say a moment ago. So gender scripts, these are expectations that we have about certain situations that can guide behavior. For example, I, uh, I got into a debate with a friend of mine about who should pay on a first date, particularly um, if the date is between a man and a woman. And I made the argument that it's still a pretty common social norm for the man to pay for dinner on the first date. However, my friend disagreed with me and felt that it's more common now for both man or woman to pay on the first date. Next slide. So this is not official empirical research, mind you, okay? So, you know, don't, don't say like, well, she said, and this was research, no, I, I can't completely, but just for fun, um, I posted a Facebook, um, well, I made two Facebook posts. One was on my um, public, or not my public, but my personal profile. And then I went to a private group that was just completely women. In the group that was private with women, I asked this question, if a man asked you to pay for dinner on a first date, would you go on a date with him? He didn't forget his wallet and he has a well-paying job. 
a number of women respond to this. I would say I got over 60 responses to this comment. And the majority of them were something along the lines that were right here on the right. Dude, no, no way. Without a good reason, heck no. Well, hell no, right? The last guy that asked me that, I told him I will pay for myself and left. Now, I will say about maybe 25% of the women did ask questions like, who invited who out to dinner? And then there was a very, very small percentage that said, hey, it's okay for women to pay. So clearly the social script today, even by today in the United States, um, is still that a lot of women expect the guy to pay for dinner on the first date, especially if it was the guy that asked the woman out. Next slide. We're not gonna get into a lot of detail on this, but I do wanna take a quick glimpse into the gender socialization process. That is how we start to understand things like gender scripts and gender roles, because this is something that occurs very, very early on. Children began to, under, begin to understand gender identity around the age of two. That is, they start to get a sense that they're either male or they're female. By the age of three to four, children start to associate a variety of things with either males or females. Um, so, for example, um, they start to understand that, you know, maybe girls wear dresses and that um, boys play with Legos and matchbox cars. But children at the age of three to four, they don't understand that um, there's a concept called gender constancy. That is, you know, they, they don't understand that maleness and femaleness are biological and can't change. So in the example of my bears over here, we can very quickly identify which is the male bear bit. Yeah, male bear and which is the female bears. The male bear is completely, you know, the one with wearing the tie, right? And, and then the female bear, that's the one wearing the, you know, pink bow. And we also associate it not only with what they're wearing, but with the colors, right? Boys are traditionally um, blue, or blue is traditionally a boy color and pink is traditionally a female color. And we could take those off, and because I'm pretty sure by the way that I'm looking at it, there's no specific genitalia on those. So we could switch around, like, which is the female bear and which one's the male bear. And that's kind of how the three to four-year-olds think. So, like, if a boy were to put on a dress, then suddenly that boy might become a girl. And so they associate the types of behaviors um, and types of things that people do as men and women as characterizing what is considered to be a boy or a girl. But then as children get older, by the age of six or seven, they develop that gender constancy. That is, they start to understand the biological basis of being male and female. Fathers tend to insist on conformity to gender roles more than mothers. That is, in interacting with their children, fathers tend to be stricter. So fathers are less reluctant to allow their daughters to engage in rough and tumble play. And in the case of little boys, they don't want their boys to do anything that would be perceived as weak. And they tend to be, that is, fathers tend to be stricter with the boys than they are with the girls. And then, of course, we have peers. Um, peers are there to reinforce these gender expectations. And just like with the fathers, those expectations tend to be harsher and worse for boys than it is for girls. I can remember when I was a kid, um, one of my favorite cartoons, and it was a very popular cartoon, was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. There's been more recent movies that are out that it doesn't quite ring a bell, but to give you kind of an abbreviated version, like a summary of what it's about, is there's these four mutant turtles that are about my size, like human height. Um, they look kind of human. They can talk and they can play, they can um, fight. They know martial arts. There was a giant rat that taught them how to do that. And then they have a friend who's a news reporter. Her name's April O'Neil. So I love the turtles. My favorite one was Donatello. I have a you know, stuffed animal of them still to this day. But when I go on the playground, I was never allowed to be one of the turtles because girls aren't turtles. Girls are April O'Neil or worse, they were April O'Neil's friend Irma. I definitely did not want to be Irma. But sometimes there would be other girls that wanted to do the turtles, you know, play the role of the turtles too, because that was more fun. Whereas if I was April O'Neil, I just went around with a camera kind of taking, you know, shots of the, the boys playing and having all the fun. But I never came across a guy that said that he wanted to be April O'Neil. And as I was kind of thinking that as an example, I thought that was interesting. And that kind of fits in with what I'm saying, where the reinforcement for these roles tends to be harsher for boys than it actually is for girls. Next slide. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of pink and a lot of blue, right? Yeah, and we can recognize this very quickly, right? You know, blue, you know, in our culture is usually associated with being a boy, things like matchbox cars and trains. And then over here on the left, we have pink and we have Care Bears and we have Disney princesses and Barbie dolls. 
As you may be starting to see, gender becomes one of the most important ways of interpreting information around the world. We categorize certain objects and activities into gender categories. We have associations with color, like we see here. Um, color is definitely arbitrary. That's something that's culturally constructed in terms of what we prefer, like in terms of gender preferences. At one time, it actually was pink. Well, it used to be a, a boy color um, in more Western societies. Um, by the way, Korea, pink is actually a, a girl color in Korea. We also pay attention to mannerisms, um, hair twirling, you know, things like that. Um, that's something that a girl does. I'm trying to wash myself and not talk with my hands too much because that's also something girls do. When I think of guys and their mannerisms, like I think I'm like putting their hand down their pants or adjusting themselves. Um, <laughs> uh, the pitch of their voice, we pay attention to the pitch of other people's voices, how people walk. And we ask ourselves, is this feminine or is it masculine? And, and I, you know, I shouldn't even say we ask ourselves because we categorize it so quickly that we don't even actually have to put thought to it. And children pick this up at a very, very early age. And once they do, they try to maintain consistency between gender categories and behaviors. And by the end of early childhood, kids already have a fairly strong sense of gender norms and they're adhering to them. Next slide. In puberty, we see an intensification of gender roles. Oops, I just <laughs> flipped my paper around. Um, there's um, gender researchers, John Hill and Mary Ellen, I just moved away from the microphone. Um, they said that psychological and behavioral differences between males and females become more pronounced at adolescence because of intensified socialized pressure to conform to culturally prescribed gender roles. Um, so they make the claim that it's not just hormones. And in fact, um, from Hill and Lynch's perspective, it's actually more of a socialization process that creates the intensification, the stronger desire from men and women to conform to very rigid gender roles. For women, once they go through menstruation, it's like you have achieved womanhood. For guys, on the other hand, it's not the same. It's like they have to have specific traits or characteristics before they can be granted their manhood. So here again, the situation seems to be a little bit more difficult for men as opposed to women. Slide. So what makes a man a man? Um, there's a researcher at Boston College by the name of Mahalik. He did interviews with 140 men between the ages of 18 and 75. And these are the traits that he found that most men associate with being a man. There's emotional control, primacy of work, pursuit of status, and violence. These are characteristics that I found pop up in research again and again. And despite, regardless of where these traits come from, be it biological or society, they are culturally reinforced through expectations of other men. Next slide. According to sociologist Michael S. Kamel, manhood is demonstrated for other men's approval. Way too far. Bear with me, I lost my page. Um, as I mentioned earlier, fathers tend to insist on conformity to gender roles more than mothers, and peers act as gender police for a wide range of behaviors. In this way, cultural myths on gender become self-fulfilling prophecies. Men are always under the careful scrutiny of other men. Manhood is demonstrated for other men's approval, according to Kamel. For example, men often boast to each other. And when I think of this, I, I just picture a man sending a text message to another man like, I hooked up with this chick last night and she was so fine. Men boast about all kinds of things, wealth, power, status, and especially women. Men have admitted that they will perform heroic feats, take enormous risks, all because they want other men to grant them their manhood. Next slide. Who's the sissy? <laughs> In many ways, masculinity is defined by what it is not. When comparing themselves to other men, men are afraid that they will not measure up, that they will not be perceived as real men. And men do not want anyone to know that they're afraid because fear is weakness. When men recognize fear in themselves, they feel shame because it is proof that they do not measure up. In other words, men don't want to be seen as sissies. Sociologist Kamel, uh, said that he could go to a playground and he could start a fight on pretty much any playground where young boys are playing by just asking one question, who's the sissy? 
Kimmel argues that the fear of being seen as a sissy dominates the cultural definitions of manhood. Men have this constant fear of being unmasked. So everything a man does from the way he dresses, how he talks, how he eats has to be kept in check. The stakes of perceived sissydom are enormous, sometimes matters of life and death. And men will take enormous risks to prove their manhood. And as we're gonna talk about, this includes things like health risks, workplace hazards, and stress-related illnesses. Next slide. So the first time, and I'm a psychologist, so the first time I ever read Sigmund Freud's theory of psychosexual development, I was like, wow, dude, wow. Uh, if you're not familiar with Freud, you know, definitely check this guy out. Um, one of the things that he proposed is that women have penis envy. That's right. According to Freud, I wish that I literally had a penis. It's interesting. Um, so some people took issue of this. Um, one such person was a neo-Freudian psychoanalyst by the name of Karen Horney. Uh, she responded to this by saying, why on earth would I want a penis? You know, it's the man that has to perform, the woman that just has to lay there. I don't want one of those things. She said, but what we do want, on the other hand, is what the penis represents. Men have all this power simply because they're men. Well, this idea that men have power and women don't, I mean, this is the basis of feminism and this drive for gender equality. And as a group, men do have a lot of power. You know, Brooke introduced me, she told you I work at West Shore Community College, and I can tell you most of my colleagues are men. That's how it is in a lot of colleges and universities. Men still dominate that particular field that I'm in. So it does seem like men have a lot of power. If we look at this slide here, as of 2008, 95.2% .2 of chief operating officers at Fortune 500 companies are men. The 115th Congress in 2017 was made up of 81% male. And then in 2020, women earned 30% less than men. From where I'm standing as a woman, it makes sense to me to accuse men of having all the power. Again, as a group, men do have a lot of power. But on a more individual level, some men report feeling powerless. There is a discrepancy between the social and psychological realities. Socially, as a group, men have more power than women. But psychologically, many men cannot meet their own gender expectations. By their own standards, they are never enough. The paradox is that men are taught that they have all this power, but they don't actually feel it themselves. Next slide. The rules of manhood are constructed in such a way that only the tiniest fraction of men meet the criteria for manhood. Historically, there have been groups of men who represented the sissies, the not real men. Uh, so in the early 19th century, Native American men were often compared to naive children. In the late 19th century, Irish and Italian male immigrants were too passionate and emotional to be considered real men. Jews were seen as too bookish. In the 19th century, African-American men, particularly slaves, were viewed as helpless and weak. In the 20th century, Asian men were seen as small, soft, and effeminate, hardly men at all. And then gay men were, and often still are, viewed as weak. These men are the other to which the real men compare themselves. The problem is that by the time we're done excluding everyone from manhood, that's, there's hardly anyone left. And suddenly the majority of American men are not real men. And as I mentioned before, Men will go to great lengths to prove that they are men. Men have a number of ways of proving they are not sissies, including emotional suppression, bullying other men, and violence. While there are some social benefits to being a man, there are also costs. Next slide. So in the introduction that Brooke gave you, she talked about deaths of despair. Um, we're gonna be talking about that, and this, this definitely falls underneath this category. In the US, men commit 90% of homicides Men represent 77% of homicides victims in the US and the death of despair part falls under this last statistic. Worldwide, men are four times more likely than women to die of suicide. These are not statistical anomalies. There are huge discrepancies between men and women and the problem is not restricted to homicide and suicide as we'll see. Next slide. Princeton economists Ann Case and Angus Deacon published in their findings on what they called death of despair. They looked at CDC mortality data and found a rise in deaths from suicide, alcohol, liver disease, and overdoses of heroin and prescription opioids. 
They saw the highest increase for middle-aged white men, especially men with low levels of education. Men with less than high school education, with high school education or less, um, their death rates rose by 20%. Uh, for men with a college education, their death rates actually fell. Next slide. Middle-aged non-Hispanic whites without college education are also unhappier, reportedly, as you can see here on this chart. Uh, whereas men with college degrees um, kind of plateaued a little bit, actually even slightly decreased, or, or actually slightly increased. We're looking at the wrong direction. It's not arguing, I'm not arguing um, that everyone needs a bachelor's degree. Um, in the research by Case and Deaton, um, it, it looks more like something like an existential crisis that might be taking place. According to Deaton, meaning of life was once tied to employment. A miner or a factory worker identified themselves as such. I have a brother-in-law who works uh, in a Pittsburgh steel mill uh, and he's proud to be a, a Pittsburgh steel mill worker. And in fact, a few years ago, he gave me some beer that actually had a label on it, you know, where it was like for the Pittsburgh steel mill workers. And, and they take pride in, in these industries, which is, I mean, there was a time in our country where that was the case, but we're seeing a decline of this. You know, it's not the same level of connection working in, in a warehouse like an Amazon warehouse. And we can only imagine how the pandemic has exasperated these issues. Uh, the original research by Case and Deaton, they tend to focus on middle-aged whites, um, but we're actually also seeing a raise or um, a rise in death rates in middle-aged blacks. Deaton and Case, they were primarily looking at socioeconomic factors in the deaths of despair, and the research showed that the United States is an outlier uh, when you compare the deaths of despair to wealthy European countries. That is, we're not seeing the same death rates in wealthy European countries, but there is an exception to this, and that is Scotland. Next slide. So Scotland has the highest rate of drug deaths in Europe. Um, deaths related to drugs, suicide, and alcohol are the three leading causes of what they call external deaths. And I'll explain that in a moment. And they'd also found a negative correlation between education, deaths, and despair. So just like with Deaton, they found that they're more likely to have deaths and despair with low, people with lower levels of education. So mortality related to internal causes versus external causes was one of the things um, that the researchers in Scotland looked at. Internal causes refers to things like cancer and cardiovascular disease. And then external causes, um, that refers to things like alcohol use and drug addiction. Drug overdoses account for 50% of the deaths related to external causes in 2018 in Scotland. In 1981, it was just 3%. Here again, men are at the highest risk, particularly non-Hispanic white men. For Scotland, men aged 15 to 44, the leading cause of death are drugs and suicide, and deaths of suicide doubled between 1980 and 2000. So what is causing this? So Scottish researchers report that there is a weakening of social structures, such as marriage and church, things that might give meaning to life. There's also deteriorating labor markets, industrial jobs for men are less available, and men in some cases are excluded from the service sector. And some men fear being ridiculed for working in the service sector, which was traditionally female. The men are experiencing a lack of social support and some men report feeling powerless. Comparatively, European countries with active labor markets programs do not experience increases of suicide and alcohol abuse during economic recessions. So some of the findings are like Case and Deaton's. Men with a college education are more likely to die, or sorry, men without a college education are more likely to die from deaths of despair, and changes in the labor market are also linked to deaths of despair. There is plenty of research to support a link between environmental factors and substance abuse, and that's what we're going to look at next. Um, next slide. So this is a, a classic psychological study. Um, this is actually um, research from the 1970s is what we're going to start off talking about first. So there was a study where you would take rats and you would place them in a cage and it would just, well, I guess you would say there was one rat placed in a cage and the rat was given a bottle of water that would be laced with heroin or cocaine and then another bottle of water that didn't have any drugs in it. Shortly after the rat was placed in the cage with those bottles of water, the rat would very quickly choose the drug water and then die from overdose. In the 1970s, psychologist Bruce Alexander he looked at this study and one of the things that he noticed was the cage is empty except for the rat and the bottles of water. And he wondered what would happen if I changed the environment. Uh, so what he did is he created what he called 
rat park. Uh, he took uh, a bunch of rats, put them all in the same cage, gave them things like a bunch of cheese and tunnels. And they had all these rat friends that they could hang out with. And again, he placed the two types of bottles of water, the plain water, and then the bottle that was filled with the drugs, you know, heroin or cocaine. In rat park, the rats didn't really care for the drug water. If they did use it, they never used it compulsorily and they never died of overdose. In 2015, uh, a researcher, Joanne Hari, conducted, um, concluded that a lack of meaningful connections is strongly linked to drug use. People who have solid meaningful bonds are less likely to suffer from substance use disorder. And where he got this conclusion was he started off with the research conducted in the 1970s and looking at Rat Park and looking at that idea that improving the environment was likely to improve the lives of the rats and make it less likely that they would actually engage in drug use. And then he looked at instances within human cultures um, where that had taken place. For example, one of the things that he cites is Portugal had decriminalized drug use and that they had actually created programs to support people. And, and as a result of that, people were less likely to use drugs. I mentioned this in relation to some of the things that we talked about, you know, looking at the economy, the changes in our industry, the lack of support that we have for some people could certainly be contributing factors on why we're seeing rises in substance use. Next slide. The American Psychological Association, APA, um, has certainly noticed the problems going on with men. These rises in suicide rates, um, increase in substance use, and over the past 13 years, they've worked to put together guidelines that would help practitioners, such as counselors in their work with men. And just like I said before, um, the psychologists recognize that men tend to hold a place of privilege and power based on gender. However, they experience disproportionate rates of harsher punishment. They're more likely to be suspended or expelled from school. They have more academic challenges than women. They're more likely to drop out of school. Their mental health issues, as we cited, men have higher rates of suicide. They have physical problems more often more than women, like cardiovascular issues. Uh, there are also public health concerns, violence, substance abuse, increased incarceration, and then a variety of quality of life issues, such as relational problems. And the thing with men is, and not that women never struggle with trying to get help, but compared to a man, a man is far less likely to seek help when he needs it. And so that's another issue that the APA guidelines uh, tries to address. Next slide. The APA guidelines um, for working with populations of boys and men, um, these are not the first guidelines. Um, there are actually a number of guidelines um, that the APA has put out um, to work with specific populations. Um, girls and women um, were actually the first guidelines developed. And then gay, lesbian, bisexual populations in 2012, older adults in 2014, transgender and gender non-conforming persons in 2015, and then racial and ethnic minorities in 2017. So the AP guidelines, and I had that flipped around, it should actually be boys and men. Um, for boys and men was recently in 2018. So that's the most recent of the guidelines that were put out. All of these guidelines um, serve to improve service delivery among populations, stimulate public policy initiatives, and provide professional guidance based upon advances in the field. Next slide. So this is five of the 10 guidelines. So if you, you, know, you can look at it, there's a PDF of the guidelines and these guidelines are 10 all together. And, and most of these are pretty self-explanatory, but I, I'll describe a few of them. So psychologists strive to recognize masculinities are constructed based upon social, cultural, and contextual norms. That one's a hot topic and we're to come back to that one later on. Psychologists strive to recognize that boys and men integrate multiple aspects to their social identity across the lifespan. That is men just as women. Um, they change how they view themselves and the particular roles that they take on throughout the lifespan. Psychologists understand the impact of power, privilege, and sexism on the development of boys and men and on their relationship with others. Psychologists strive to develop a comprehensive understanding of the factors that influence interpersonal relationships of boys and men. Psychologists strive to encourage positive father involvement in healthy family relationships. Next slide. Psychologists strive to support educational efforts that are responsive to the needs of boys and men. Psychologists strive to reduce the high rates of problems boys and men face and, out, um, and act out in their lives, such as aggression, violence, substance abuse, and suicide. So one of the main topics that we've been talking about today. Psychologists strive to help boys and men engage in healthy related behaviors. Psychologists strive to build and promote gender sensitive psychological services 
And then finally, psychologists understand and strive to change institutional, cultural, and systematic problems that affect boys and men through advocacy, prevention, and education. Next slide. So this seems pretty straightforward, right? No problem. And uh, no. <laughs> Uh, when these guidelines were published in 2018, um, it actually wasn't um, the guidelines themselves that created the controversy. We're going to see that in a second. But when shortly after these guidelines were published, there was a lot of controversy that was associated with that. And that's going to be the focus of the rest of our talk. Um, we're going to look at two areas of controversy with the guidelines. One is going to have to do with the way that the APA defined traditional masculinity. And then the other is gonna to have to do with the origins of gender itself. I'm gonna take off my time now. Next slide. Okay, so if you were to look at the APA guidelines, um, the APA gives a definition of what it calls traditional masculinity. And these are the characteristics associated with traditional masculinity. It's anti-femininity, achievement, avoiding the appearance of weakness. Remember, who's the sissy? Um, adventure, risk, and violence. Remember this. This is what the APA guidelines say. Next slide. Okay. The APA has a magazine that they publish. It's called The Monitor. Uh, in The Monitor, there was an article in January of 2019 that made the claim, and it's, this is what it says, that traditional masculinity is harmful to men. So now all these news sources are reporting or were reporting at that time that the APA claims that traditional masculinity is psychologically harmful. Uh -oh. And then the APA monitor lists what, can, what are the characteristics that make up traditional masculinity. Stoicism, need to dominate others, aggression and competitive. Notice those are not the same characteristics that were in the actual APA guidelines, but that was what was in the January 2019 Monitor article. But think about this. The APA, the American Psychological Association, is making the claim that traditional masculinity is unhealthy. Think of the implications for that. If you would read a headline like that, I mean, that's going to ruffle some feathers. Now, <laughs> Whenever that was published, like all hell broke loose. And, and you can look back in January, 2019, and you can see there are a number of publications and magazines and newspaper articles that were about the publication of the APA guidelines, particularly um, this monitor article. Next slide. So one of the magazines articles, or I should say newspaper articles that I saw, it came from the National Review. Um, but the author of the article was David French. Um, the title of it was With Young Men in Crisis, the American Psychological Association Wrongly Declares War on Traditional Masculinity. The author David French writes that young boys desire to become grown men, a person who is physically and mentally tough. French argues that becoming a grown man takes shaping and molding. Men need to take inherent, or men need to take inherent characteristics such as aggression, and shape them towards virtuous ends. So he's saying that aggression is not inherently a bad thing. A strong, aggressive risk taker could be a criminal or he could be a police officer. It's all a matter of how the aggression is molded. The same could be said for stoicism. Remember, that was one of the characteristics of masculinity. Uh, stoicism, you know, a certain level of that is necessary for good leaders. You need to be able to suppress your emotions to some extent in order to see a situation clearly. Men who cannot, or men who can do that, says French, rise to the top. French recognizes that certain populations of men are suffering and that the APA rightly seeks to overcome challenges men face, but the APA diagnosed the wrong cause. Traditional masculinity is not to blame. Next slide. I did a little research and um, I looked at a 2019 study published in the Journal of Masculinities in Men. Uh, and the research found that college men who adhere to the masculine norms of success and winning experience better overall well-being. Um, college men who adhere to the masculine norm of power experience a decline in overall well-being. And then masculine norms such as violence, self-reliance, heterosexual presentation, that means concern about being perceived as uh, straight, do not have statistically significant associations with well-being. So a number of the characteristics that are associated with traditional masculinity are not associated 
with uh, well-being. Um, now, I will tell you there are some limitations to the study. First of all, it, it was only conducted with college men, and so it's not exactly a, a large population. Um, but the research does negate the sweeping claim that traditional masculine norms are unhealthy. Next slide. Uh, any of you guys seen Mean Girls? I love that movie, right? The, the thing that I always remember of that movie is like the math scene towards the end, the limit does not exist. If you don't get that, I'm so sorry. All right, but anyway, so I mean, Mean Girls was about, it was a movie about mean girls. A colleague of mine recently went to see the Broadway play. I heard it was quite good. Haven't seen that one yet. The reason I'm talking about this is because in addition to men taking issue um, with this definition of traditional masculinity put out by the APA, there are actually also women uh, who took issue with the definition of traditional masculinity. Uh, a psychology researcher, Dr. Pamela Perinsky, she noted that the Broadway musical Mean Girls is about teenage women whose social success is achieved at the pain and cost of others. She points out that striving to be successful, no matter who is harmed, is by the APA's definition, traditional masculinity. So should we label women and like mean girls as traditionally masculine or should we just say that they're tough bosses? Her point is that it's not just men who are aggressive. So as you can see, some of the controversy with when the guidelines were put out, particularly that monitor article had to do with some of the wording um, that was selected by the APA. So there's a lot of controversy over the language. Conservative news sources, for the most part, they tend to view the phrasing traditional masculinity as attack on manhood itself. Um, there were APA committee members who warned, or I should explicitly say APA committee members like of the APA guidelines, so people actually served on the committee that put together these guidelines. Some of them warned the APA that using a phrase like traditional masculinity might be problematic, um, but those warnings were ignored. I admit if I, you know, as a woman read a headline that femininity is unhealthy, particularly traditional femininity, that would like get me a little angry. I can actually remember a conversation that I had with one of my male psychology professors. We were talking about depression and he said, you know why women are depressed all the time? It's because they always stir the pot. And I'm thinking, you son of a, I was like, you're sexist, you know, when we women stir the pot. Well, actually, um, there is cognitive research to back that claim. Women do tend to ruminate more than men, I'm sorry to admit. Um, so the guy actually wasn't being sexist. But nonetheless, you know, I can feel, you know, how hot I got just by that accusation. So I can kind of like get the sense of like what men felt when they actually had their masculine ideologies being stepped on. Next slide. The APA, after reading all this criticism, they issued an official statement that was placed on their APA, on the APA's website. This has since actually been taken down. Um, in, it says, um, in, it is the extreme stereotypical behaviors, not simply being male or traditional male, that may result in negative outcomes. For example, people believe that to be a real man is to get needs met through violence, dominance over others, or extreme restriction of emotions are at risk for poor physical, psychological, and social outcomes, e.g. increased risk for cardiovascular disease, social isolation, depression, relationship, distress, etc. When a man believes that he must be successful no matter who is harmed or his masculinity is expressed by being sexually abusive, disrespectful, and harmful to others, that man is conforming to the negative aspects associated with traditional masculinity. So this clarifies things a little bit. So what the APA means is these more extreme forms of stoicism and violence, well, violence in general, but you know, more extreme forms of things like stoicism is what the APA was referring to. Next slide. Uh, deaths of despair again. Uh, Ryan McDermott, uh, he was uh, someone who served on the APA committee. He was interviewed in the Atlantic and he said that we're not saying the APA, we're not saying that aggression is not okay. You know, sometimes aggression is okay. It's in its extreme forms that it becomes problematic. 70% of suicides were committed by men between 2000, this is from the APA guidelines, by the way. So 70% of the suicides were committed by men between 2000 and 2012 in the US. Substance abuse and alcohol abuse are correlated with higher suicide rates among men. And many men use alcohol or other drugs as an avoidance response to difficult emotional situations and uncomfortable affective states. Researchers believe that many men express depression covertly, manifesting as irritability, interpersonal distancing, sensitivity to threats to self-esteem, somatic complaints, and difficulty with motivation and concentration. 
As David French pointed out, a certain level of stoicism is a good thing. It helps men to see situations clearly, and I don't think he's wrong. Um, but when I read his comments, what I, the first thing that I, I want to ask myself is, is when men are pushing aside their emotions, are, are they doing this in a way that they're healthy, like regulating their emotions in a healthy way? Or are they doing something that's not so healthy? And there's a huge difference between the two. Um, and that difference could result in some of the things that we see here. You know, some of the things that we see here is the direct result of unhealthy emotional regulation. So for example, um, venting aggressive impulses, despite cult pop cultural beliefs, does not decrease aggressive drives. In other words, you know, if you punch a pillow or you know, verbally assault someone, that actually does not decrease aggression. Venting actually increases feelings of anger and hostility. So punching the pillow may feel good, but you're not going to feel less angry. It actually increases the anger. On the other end of this, if you suppress your emotions, deny them, drink them away, well, that type of emotional regulation is correlated with increased risks of mental health issues like depression and anxiety, substance abuse disorders, and relationship problems. The message, boys don't cry, is not psychologically healthy. That extreme type of stoicism is what the APA finds unhealthy. They're not saying that you can't be a tough guy, but you don't always have to be a tough guy. Vulnerability is not weakness. If you can acknowledge that you have certain feelings and then cope with them constructively, you have a much lower risk of developing mental health issues. And I'll add that's much easier said than done. Next slide. I hope you guys all know who Mr. Fred Rogers is. Um, if you haven't seen the movie A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, I highly recommend it. Rogers once said off camera, confronting our feelings and giving them appropriate expression always takes strength, not weakness. It takes strength to acknowledge our anger and sometimes more strength yet to curb the aggressive urges anger may bring and channel them into nonviolent outlets. It takes strength to face our sadness and to grieve and to let our grief and our anger flow in tears when they need to. It takes strength to talk about our feelings and to reach out for help and comfort when we need it. In my humble opinion, I think that quote from Mr. Rogers is along the lines of what the APA had in mind when they claimed that stoicism when taking extremes can be unhealthy. Next slide. Aggression and violence is another hot topic. Um, the majority of men are actually not violent. Um, so we talk about these homicides and um, these homicide rates and men being the perpetrators. Most of the men are not the ones doing this. It's just a small fraction of them. But boys and men commit about 90% of violent crimes in the United States. Men are more likely than women to use aggression and violence as a means to resolve interpersonal conflict. And for some men, violence is used to protect and enhance their own masculinity. So aggression serves as a way for men to publicly prove their masculinity. A lot of this is obvious. Um, I will mention that sometimes men are victims. Um, it's just um, statistically, it's more likely um, that the man is gonna be the perpetrator. Renee Brown, um, she was a shame researcher. She asked um, what women are most afraid of and the answer for women, one of the top ones was being raped. For men, um, the thing that they fear the most is weakness. The last point in the slide comes down to what we talked about earlier, using the other to note what is not masculine to define what is masculine. Putin's masculinity, oh, I just, sorry, next slide. <laughs> I just read the header. I'm human. <laughs> Okay, um, as I showed in, in my very first slide, I had, I had a picture of Putin. Again, I think this is very apt to talk about considering the war between Russia and Ukraine. Um, this first picture down here on the bottom, um, this was a 2014 post on Twitter. It was po posted by one of Putin's directors. And as we can see here on the right, we have President Barack Obama holding his poodle. And then of course, the, the manly Putin, he's there with the cheetah. No. Um, this is actually um, the picture of Barack Obama was before he was even president. But as I said, it was one of Putin's directors putting up this image saying we have different values than our allies, right? This picture was posted amongst heightened tension following the shooting down of flight MH17 in Ukraine, which left 298 people dead. There are a number of articles that you can find that were even within the last week that talk about Putin and his masculinity. Putin's traditional masculine ideology glorifies violence. 
For Putin, aggression is natural and unavoidable. Men like Putin refuse to show any vulnerability. This makes any sort of negotiations especially difficult. Now I've heard news reporters argue that Putin is not going to stop the war with Ukraine unless he is able to save face. This is a man that will avoid being perceived as weak at all costs, even if it means more violence and destruction, because to a man like Putin, violence and aggression equal strength. So Putin's brand of masculinity is what some would deem toxic masculinity. Next slide. So the APA's traditional masculinity is in many ways equivalent to a phrase that we see in pop culture called toxic masculinity. Uh, toxic masculinity, these are certain masculine norms that are associated with harm to society and men themselves. So things like sexual harassment, domestic violence, men bullying other men, and they fall under the purview of toxic masculinity. And Thomas, I, I made an error, next slide. So there's a video. <laughs> on here. I don't know if you're able to pull it up for me while I read this next section, Thomas, or not. Um, so this is a Gillette video, We Believe the, the Best in Men Can Be. Okay. Um, so after the APA guidelines um, were published, Gillette put out a controversial commercial, and this is very shortly after the publication of the guidelines. Um, the ad was put out in response to the Me Too movements. The ad urges men to hold each other accountable, to, set up, uh, to step up when they see fellow men acting inappropriately towards women and other men. The ad received intense criticism on social media with many men calling for a boycott of Gillette. I'll just pause here for a second. Are there any questions both here uh, live and folks in the audience on Zoom? Yes, sir. There. We're going to get a mic to you, just a sec. Nathan, great. In the uh, Ethan and Case studies, you, you focused in on 45 to 54. Would the same kinds of trends have extended on uh, either side of that particular age group? Um, so we, we do see, especially with the Scotland study too, we do see lower age groups and demographics, um, but that was one of the main age groups that Deaton and Case focused in on. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Nate, uh, Nathan has another one here, and then one back here, but right here. Sir, if you could please. Whitman, no, you, please. Oh, you need the mic just because people can't hear you online. Thanks. I just say, what's your sign Sorry. Interesting in that the woman in the background is, does not appear to be paying any attention, and the two men on the other side are watching quite closely. Yes, that is a good point. And uh, if you were, if we actually were able to watch the video, you would know why. <laughs> That's it. There was another question. Did you have a question, ma'am? No? It may be just slightly off point, but I was wondering why when you punch into a pillow, does that, did you say increase violence or not relieve aggression? Right, so uh, if you wanted the biological reason for it. Um, so uh, whenever we feel anger, it initiates our fight or flight response, probably familiar with that. So like whenever you feel anxious, you feel like your heart rate go up, your breathing go up. And anger can also um, initiate that fight or flight response. And so um, a lot of times you might be recommended uh, to help with emotions by like going for a run or something like that. But in the case of anger, it actually doesn't help that. Um, what it does is it just kind of keeps the fight or flight response kind of in check and, and it keeps the, uh, the aggressive urges going as opposed to suppressing it. Um, whereas if you were to relax, it would counteract that response. Yes, that is the correct video. Okay, we'll go on to the video now and we'll come back to questions in a little bit. Bullying. The Me Too violence. movement against Toxic sexual harassment. masculinity. Is this the best a man can get? Is it? We can't hide from it. It's been going on far too long. 
We can't laugh it off. Who's the daddy? <laughs> what I actually think she's trying to say. Making the same old excuses. Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. But something finally changed. Allegations regarding sexual assault and sexual harassment. Once, but she says he's a the And there will be no going back. Because we, we believe in the best in men. Men need to hold other men accountable. Smile, sweetie. Come on. To say the right thing. To act the right oh. way. Not cool, not cool. Some already are. In ways big Yo, men. and small. I am strong. I am strong. But some is not enough. It's not how we treat each other, okay? Okay. Because the boys watching today will be the men of tomorrow. I guess you can watch it with the sound. If, if you as I said, it was a very controversial ad whenever it was put out, and then there were some men who chose to boycott Gillette as a result of that video. Um, but the main message, and why we see this picture here, why to answer your question, sir, why the woman was there first, I need to see was real quick. But then the other reason is because the emphasis in this video was that it's the responsibility of men to keep other men in check. So that that's I think if I had to interpret that, that would be my guess. Um, next slide, and thank you, Thomas. I know you guys are familiar with Wade Davis. Uh, he's a former NFL player. Um, he now speaks to men about gender inequality and masculinity at companies like Google, Netflix, and the NFL, and said that men need to confront other men about issues like sexism and bullying. He says, just like with Gillette, it's the work of other men to talk to other men. Um, during his TEDx conference, the former NFL football player began, to talk by, began his talk by telling a story about a game he and his friends played as children. The game was smear the queer. He didn't know what the queer was, but he knew that he didn't want to be one. He learned that being tough earns you social capital, but being weak or queer is suicidal. So throughout his life, Wade Davis adhered to the rigid rules of masculinity while hiding the fact that he was gay. But after a while, he got tired of wearing a mask. He wanted the freedom to be himself, so he came out as gay. Let go of traditional masculine ideals and developed his own definition of masculinity. One of the things that the APA guidelines for boys and men addresses is the emotional turmoil that men experience by trying to live up to cultural masculinities. As we talked about earlier, men will go to great lengths to prove that they are real men. And while most men wrestle with these issues, the problem is especially pronounced for homosexuals, bisexuals, non-binary and transgender populations. We talked earlier about the educational gap and what it means for men's happiness. If trends continue, for every two women who complete college, one man will complete college. As a group, men are lagging behind women in educational attainment. There is one exception. Gay men are actually outperforming other men. 52% of gay men aged 25 or older hold a bachelor's degree. And for comparison, 36% of adults 25 or older have a bachelor's degree. Gay men also outperform their straight male peers in high school. Uh, while this, um, why this is, according, well, why this is, um, one explanation is um, the best little boy in the world hypothesis. That is, young closeted men direct attention from their sexuality by investing in the recognized markers of success, good grades, athletic achievement, and elite employment, and so on. Next slide. Now, you may think that um, this, I, phrase toxic masculinity came from the feminist movement. It actually didn't. Um, it came from the mythopoetic men's movement. Uh, this was actually a reaction to second wave feminism. The movement believed that men's aggressive impulses, the toxic impulses, um, come from a society which tries to feminize men. And men would go on wilderness treats and play in drum circles to get in touch with their deep masculinity to rid themselves of their toxic masculinity. Today, um, conservative discourse on toxic masculinity views as an attack on manhood and for progressive masculinity, toxic masculinity, or for progressives, I should say, masculinity is viewed as something that needs to be detoxified. 
um, as a way to create gender equality. Next slide. So I mentioned before that there are two issues um, that we saw in terms of controversy with the APA guidelines. One of them had to do with the phrase traditional masculinity, and then the other one has to do with biology. Uh, if you look at um, the APA guidelines um, and the APA website, on one of the posts about the guidelines in the APA website, it says guidelines acknowledge that men are not biologically hard hardwired for displaying violence or aggression. And then the very first guideline we saw states that masculinities are constructed based on social, cultural, and contextual norms. Next slide. Steven Pinker, a research psychologist at Harvard University, interviewed uh, by the New York Times about the APA guidelines. And the first thing that he pointed out was that testosterone is not mentioned anywhere in the APA guidelines. Uh, to borrow from one of Pinker's TED Talks, he said, anyone who has two children will immediately recognize that they're not the same. Anyone who has a child and a house pet will also immediately recognize that eventually the child develops a capacity for human language, whereas a dog does not. So clearly there are any differences between the two. The same could also be applied for gender, that there could be difference, differences in the way that one child would express femininity or masculinity depending upon the child's status. What I'm talking about here is the classic nature versus nurture debate. Um, we can take different stances on this. The extreme nature stance on gender would say that something like aggression and violence is entirely innate. The extreme nurture stance on the other hand would say that males and females are biologically indistinguishable. All differences are the product of socialization. And then of course there are various intermediate positions on it. Next slide. So I looked at uh, a 2017 Pew survey to see where um, the US population stands on this particular topic. You know, what we feel about in terms of what are the biological and what are the social factors that contribute to gender. Uh, there is a huge difference um, politically. Democrats are more likely than Republicans to attribute specific gender differences like parenting, hobbies, and emotional expression to uh, social expectations rather than biological differences. Uh, but if you look at some of these, um, so the first question is like, is there a difference between men and women? And then how much? And then if there is a difference, is the difference the result of biology or society? So let's take the first one, for example. So like how men and women express feelings. Um, is there a similarity or difference? Well, the people who responded to the survey believe that it's mostly different between men and women, how they express their emotions. And where does that come from? Well, 42% of it's biology, and then 58% of it is society, according to this poll. Some researchers argue um, that socialization is not independent of biology when it comes to looking at gender. Our genes influence our psychological characteristics. Gender is no exception. In research, though, it's very difficult to separate biological and social interactions. Uh, for gender, it may be helpful for us to look at prenatal development. Next slide. I was like, I love this slide when I found it. It's so trippy, right? Um, so in prenatal development, um, the genitals begin to form at the third month of prenatal development. It's during this time that we start to see hormones influencing a variety of things, such as brain organization, body size, and activity levels. And particularly the hormones that I'm referring to are androgens and estrogens. Testosterone is an example of an androgen. On average, uh, boys become larger and more active. We can't ethically manipulate a fetus's hormones, um, but there have been natural experiments that can give us some insight into the role hormones play in shaping gender. Next slide. One of the things um, that we're going to look, well, one thing that we're going to look at is classical congenital adrenal hyperplasia, um, abbreviated CCAH. Um, so CAH without the classical part, this is an inherited disorder of adrenal glands that can affect both boys and girls. Um, the adrenal glands these are located above the kidneys. They produce three types of hormones, including androgens. Again, remember I said um, a type of androgen is a testosterone. Classical CAH is the least common and is the most severe. In girls born with CCAH, they are genetically female. That is their chromosomes are XX, um, but they're exposed to excess androgens during prenatal development. So many develop masculinized genitalia that is often fixed with surgery. 
Uh, treatments occur shortly after birth, so postnatal androgens are low and are typically raised as females. So in other words, um, these women, uh, whenever they're born, uh, they are biologically, their sex is female, but sometimes they have, as it says on the PowerPoint, some genitalia, to, genitalia that looks, resembles a man, but this is something that could be very easy. Well, I shouldn't say easily, but it's something that can be fixed with surgery. And then they are still socialized as women. But the catch here is that during prenatal development, as we just said, you know, we have these hormones that are involved in the organization of our brain. And so there's a difference in the way that women with CCAH experience those hormones and the way that it influences the development of their brain compared to women who do not have CCAH. Next slide. So there are a number of studies um, that looked at CCAH in women. And the purpose of the study was to see if there were differences in those women versus women who did not have CCAH with regards to how they expressed gender. Um, the studies compare CCAH females with non-CCAH females to see if androgens masculize the behaviors of CCAH females. In some studies, a female child was born with CCAH uh, were compared with sisters not born with CCAH to kind of control for environment. The study found that androgens influence personality characteristics the most and gender identity the least. In other words, it influenced um, certain activities and interests the most, um, but many of them still identified as female. Um, so results were studied across countries and age groups. Um, three to 12 year old girls born with CCAH showed more interest in boy toys than their non-CCAH sisters but they didn't have as much interest as boys comparatively. Uh, but when we looked at the two, 10 to 13 year old group, they did have much more um, traditional male interests. And so what I'm talking about is engaging in things like rough and tumble play, the type of toys that they play with like matchbox cars. Um, and then um, later on, they also, um, these researchers looked at women as they went into their careers. And they found that some of the women with CCH went into traditional um, masculine careers like becoming a car mechanic. Uh, and they found that the more androgen exposure was correlated with interest in more traditional activities. Next slide. So with regards to biology, um, again, this is just, you know, it's one meta-analysis study um, looking at the contributions. And it, as I said before, it's, it's very difficult to tease out biology and sociocultural factors. Uh, but the question for me is, you know, why would anyone overlook biology and gender studies, which it commonly is. Um, as Dr. Steven Pinker, um, the man I referenced before, is the Harvard psychologist, he said that a self, and he proclaims himself to be a feminist, um, if we overlook biology, we can use social engineering to shape humanity. On the other hand, if we have biological instincts, we might be condemned to certain things like prejudice, selfishness, and violence. But uh, we don't need to be afraid of that, if that would happen to be the case. You know, if science shows that we do have instincts, for example, if men are inherently more aggressive, that does not mean that we have to accept the violence and aggression as inevitable. Motives do not equal behaviors. We can override certain impulses like selfishness. A friend of mine once put it to me this way, everyone gets hungry, but we all have table manners. <laughs> In response to the accusation that the APA overlooked biology, particularly testosterone, um, one psychologist, Ryan McKelly, uh, who contributed to the research for the APA guidelines for boys and men, reported in the New York Times that the guidelines do not reject biological determinants. Instead, it was just beyond the scope of those particular guidelines. However, um, the APA did claim that gender is socially constructed, and they did say that there is no biological basis for violence and aggression. Uh, but when it comes to problems men face, they did include biology. Uh, so I actually pulled um, this quote directly from the APA guidelines. This is on page three. It says, in summary, contemporary studies indicate that the physical and mental health concerns of boys and men are associated with complex and diverse economic, biological, developmental, psychological, and sociocultural factors. And so all the things that we've been talking about tonight, the research for Case and Deaton, um, the research done by um, the researchers in Scotland, um, what we're seeing is, you know, it's not just one factor. We're not just saying it's just traditional masculinity that's causing this, but it's certainly one of the contributing factors um, from the APA's perspective. The 2018 guidelines, um, they were published 
in 2018 for boys and men. Um, for the guidelines have a shelf life of eight to 10 years. Um, for, for me, it will be interesting to see what changes, um, especially in light of some of the controversy surrounding the current guidelines. Next slide. So where do we go from here? Um, I compiled a list of recommendations based upon the APA guidelines for boys and men. So notice your own stereotypes about masculinity and pay attention to how these stereotypes influence your behavior. Do you feel limited by those stereotypes? If you identify as a man, maybe you want to redefine what being a man means to you. Recognize that the roles of men and how they perceive themselves in those roles change throughout the lifespan. A lot of fathers can probably attest to how having a child has changed their lives. Many men take fewer risks after the birth of their first child. Among things to keep in mind is that given that so many men are career driven, retirement can be a very difficult life transition. Hold other men accountable. That was the message of the Gillette ad. And the APA guidelines asked men to recognize that the role they play in perpetuating certain cultural norms, calling men out on things like sexism and bullying can go a long way to alleviating problems in our society. And then finally, vulnerability is not weakness. One of the main goals of the APA guidelines for boys and men is to find ways to help men. Uh, so whether you're a man or a woman, seek help when you need it. And the next three slides are my references. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, just because online can't hear me if I'm not mic'd and, and that's why everybody needs to be mic'd in this room. Um, so are there any questions? I know we're, um, we're nearly at 8.30, but we've got a couple minutes here. Um, any questions that folks have? Um, good, there's one here. I know I had a couple, so. Thank you very much. I learned a lot, first of all. And second, um, do you have any suggestions on, um, I've, I've often personally as a, a female had a hard time calling out other men for behaviors that I didn't think, you know, were appropriate. Is there a way to do that without also offending them in their masculinity at the same time and having a negative effect, you know, kind of the opposite of what I wanted to do? I guess it would depend on the behavior. You know what I mean? Like if, if, if a man's like, you know, standing up behind a woman in line and grabbing her rear end, I'd be like, dude, I mean, that's, yeah. <laughs> that, that's, that's obviously not cool. Mm -hmm. um, but it, more milder forms of that, you know, maybe where um, like in the video, the Gillette ad, I, one of the things that I saw that, that really stood out to me was, you know, where he had a man in a conference room and he's like, well, what she's really trying to say is, since like this man is now gonna speak on my behalf, thank you so much for doing that, right? Um, in that case, you know what I mean? Not calling the man out in public because that's gonna offend his ego, but having a conversation on the side and you know, psychologists always like to say, use I feel messages. And so instead of like pointing your finger at somebody and saying, you did this and you made me feel this way. He was like, you know, I, I kind of feel really hurt and upset and, and a little bit degraded um, whenever you spoke on my half. In the future, maybe would you allow me to speak for myself? I'd really appreciate that. Does that help? Okay. I, I thought myself when with that ad, um, it, it made me call to mind that I have seen men in my life get very, very angry if another man violates a woman. But I don't remember ever seeing a father intervene with two fighting boys. You know, that would, that's sort of the way that it was portrayed in the, in the scene. Somebody said, some, yes, is Nathan, if you'll go over there. Oh, I have a couple. In, in response, the last speaker probably has never worked in an elementary school. <laughs> Aha. It's true. I have not worked in an elementary school. <laughs> uh, I, I just like to observe 
on, you know, as having gone through quite a few decades of life, that this issue is so different than what I experienced growing up in the 50s. I mean, there, it, it was, there was never anything open to discussion on such topics in the 50s. In my elementary school, in this, when the boys would go out and slide down the hill in the wintertime at recess and get all wet, our, our principal made them go back to, to class wearing girls' clothes. Oh. Wow. <laughs> Not good. And there was just such a strict division between what boys could, girl, could do and what girls could do. And that's changed enormously over my lifetime. And I, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that, that at some point we will focus on humanity rather than, than gender. Thank you. I have a couple um, notes from the chat. One says, great job. Another one said, just a comment, I really appreciate the fact this presentation was consistently based in sound research. Thank you so much. Thank you. One, one other question I have up there is a, a hand up right at the moment was, um, and for those who perhaps were in poetry writing and all of that, especially when Robert Bly was active, he's an American poet, um, and he did a lot of the drumming sessions with men in the wilderness. And, and so I called to mind, he was an extremely um, both gentle and um, uh, soft kind of man um, in his presentation. And, um, but I'm wondering that the, when you said the, um, and I kind of tried to write it down, the mythopoetic, mythopoetic um, <laughs> And, and whether that was, it was on the, I think on the, on the slide, it, it asked, it said that that was connected in, in the response to the second wave of feminism. Was it a negative response? Was it that they didn't like what, what women feminists at that time were saying about men? Or what, what was it? <laughs> so, and I, I could be wrong on my interpretation, but my interpretation of it was, you know, they, it was kind of taken as a little bit of an affront. You know I mean, and, and that, you know, these toxic masculine traits, so like the reason that men are violent or aggressive is because they don't have the proper way to channel it. And so because you're like, you're feminizing boys, you're not giving them these opportunities to properly vent these violent and aggressive impulses, let's find a way for them to productively do this, you know, in these things like these drum circles. And so it wasn't a, a way to say like, you know, aggression and violence is a good thing. It was just kind of like their own way of doing it. Any other question anyone might have tonight? Well, it is um, a lot to think about, a lot of different um, ideas and sources and how we, uh, at least for me, how you know, I go about my days and thinking about um, who men are and various comments and ideas. Um, so thank you very much, Jessica, for bringing us the, the APA guidelines and response to them. I do have a question from Thomas. I do. There is a question in the chat, but I think it came directly to me. So I will read that. Oh, okay. Um, uh, please fill out the surveys and thank you very much. Um, we will see you next week. Same time, same place. Okay. Good night. So. Oh, the question is, what influence does the availability to socialized medicine in Europe, with the exception of Scotland, have on the increased incidence of the issues in North America? You have to repeat that to me. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, does socialized medicine, so Scotland doesn't have socialized medicine, Apparently, okay. does that have an effect on the suicide rate and the increase in um, deaths of despair? Yeah, that, one, uh, that was actually something that was mentioned in the article um, with regards to their lack of access. And actually, I'm trying to remember now, Deaton and Case mentioned the same exact thing, um, that there's issues with lack of resources in terms of healthcare within our country that also may lead to instances of, it, not just even with the instances of increased suicide rates and alcohol use, but also other health-related problems, things that Scotland would have classified as being internal issues, things like increased cardiovascular disease, cancer, et cetera. There is some correlation. What? There is some correlation. There is a correlation. Yes, yeah. yes. yes. Yeah. Sorry, to answer that, so that, that long, the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much. <laughs>